Welcome to Ridgeway University, the Baptist Faith and Message. And we are still in Article 2, which is God. But now we're going to move to God the Father. We're going to then talk about God the Son next time and God the Holy Spirit next time as well. But let's just talk about God the Father for a few minutes. He reigns with providential care over his universe, his creatures, and the flow of the stream of human history according to the purposes of his grace. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, and all-wise. God is Father in truth to those who become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He is fatherly in his attitude toward all men. That's the Baptist Faith and Message, Article 2a on God the Father. I want to talk about providence for a minute. Uh, you know, a lot of times people say, well, good luck. Or they'll say, um, well, that was just meant to be. Or they'll say, well, I guess it wasn't in the cards. Uh, or, or, well, the planets lined up just right. They'll use all of these things innocently that are from paganism. But here's what we ought to say with biblical accuracy. God be with you. Um, God in his providence allowed this to happen. Um, providence is God's ruling and overruling in the affairs of men. It doesn't take away our freedom, but it's that God is caring for us. He's making sure we have what we need. And he is, uh, in, the, in that providing, also getting his purposes accomplished. Um, the greatest example of this is Joseph. Remember Joseph, the favorite son of uh, Israel, who was formerly called Jacob. And he was sold into slavery by his brothers. They had uh, told their father he was killed by a wild animal. They ripped up his coat of many colors. They threw him in a pit. You know, the caravan came through. He got taken to Egypt. Uh, he even was lied about uh, by Potiphar's wife. His boss's wife said he tried to sleep with me, but Joseph was innocent. He even ran out away when she very compellingly grabbed hold of his garment. And then in the prison, he helped people. He interpreted dreams, but they forgot him. And he finally uh, gets before Pharaoh and solves the dilemma, the problem of having plenty of food now, but being ready for a famine later because God had revealed it through Pharaoh's dream. And then he's reunited with his brothers as they come to buy food from him. And he said to them in the spirit of forgiveness, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. In other words, God knew that y'all would need food one day. So he got me to Egypt, albeit a difficult way, through being sold into slavery, and you hated me because I was the favorite of my father, but it all turned out for your good. That wasn't luck. That was not chance. That was God, the Father, in his fatherly care and his providence over his people. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God provides for us even today. The Sermon on the Mount tells us Life is more than food and the body more than garment. And God has given us our lives and our bodies, but he will give us other things. And if we will seek him, we will be provided for. Our basic needs will be because he even cares about the birds of the air and the wildflowers in the field. And you recognize that as part of Matthew 6, Sermon on the Mount. Um, so if I or to define God's providence in my own world, my own words, excuse me, I would say God's rule and his overruling in the affairs of men. And so I think there are four ways. Um, he's in his providence put cause and effect into, a play, into place. There are natural laws like gravity, um, he said uh, to his children, um, choose life. I, I want to bless you, but if you don't abide by my covenant, you'll be cursed. And Paul tells us 
Um, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. There's cause and effect. That doesn't limit God's providence. He's built that in. Uh, there's grace. Sometimes God just intervenes and favors us, and there's no reason at all that he should. That's part of God's providence. And then there's... Uh, God's glory in the universe. God is going to ultimately un unveil his plan and execute it, and he's going to right every wrong. Uh, evil will receive judgment. Uh, there will be justice. There will be uh, joy for his children. God rules in history. He rules in the universe, and that's his providence. Now, God is all-powerful. He's omnipotent. So the Father has no restrictions in any way. There's nothing he can't do except defy his nature. It's not his nature to be unholy, sinful, capricious, unloving. So he can't do something that's not in his nature. But there's no feat that God cannot accomplish. He is El Shaddai in the Old Testament, which means God Almighty. He's the source of everything, all power, and powers, and we ought to praise him. And so remember he's omnipotent. Remember also that he is uh, all-knowing, that is omniscient. He knows things past, present, and future. We talked about this last time, but think about this. He knows you're going to do, let's just say this, he knows I'm going to eat a peanut butter sandwich today for lunch. So now I have to because he knows it and I'm not free. Friend, that is a, that is a, a fallacy. Uh, his knowledge is not causal. And if it is, then we're just, uh, that Islam teaches that uh, Allah's knowledge is causal and that things are already determined beforehand and we really don't have any choice. Um, atheism, your genes, your, your DNA, the universe, where you were born, your environment, everything, you've really got no real, you've got some sets of choices. Those are illusory. It's all determined. It's determinism. That's atheism for you. Secular humanism, naturalism. No, God knows what you're going to do, but you're still free. The Bible doesn't try and harmonize God's sovereignty and man's free will. It just assumes both to be true. And that's a mystery that we'll have to maybe maybe find out when we get to heaven. But God's all-knowing. He's omniscient. He's all-loving, by the way. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. God never wants harm to come to anyone. That's not his desire. The Bible says he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. His love costs. That's why he sent Jesus to the cross for us. He must punish sin. He is a loving God. Therefore, he must defend his nature because he's the only one that can give meaning to life and bring us to heaven when we die. Um, he's also everywhere. He's omniscient and he's all wise. Wisdom's more than knowledge. It's knowing how to order the knowledge. It's, it's understanding, but it's more than understanding. It's got a moral component. So it's, it's, it's having all the facts, it's knowing how to order all those facts and make sense of them, and it's also doing all of that for the greatest good, the glory of God and the good of his creatures. So God is all wise, and he's the only one who is all wise. All wisdom comes from him. You, Lord, are compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abundant in faithful love and truth. By the way, Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Nothing is too difficult for you. God is all-powerful. And his judgments and his ways are untraceable and unsearchable. Romans eleven thirty three. God the Father. Let me pray for you. Father, you know what we need, and we don't have any information to reveal to you that you don't already know. May we trust you. You are a good God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.